9 or 10 o'clock in the morning that day, and for most of the people that were there, it seemed like an ordinary enough day. They were on the shore. The sun was beginning to rise. And yet if there was one thing that was slightly different from most days is that there were more people on the shore than was normal. There was the typical sight, the sun beginning to rise higher in the sky, it getting brighter and brighter. Uh, it was warming now. Wildlife could be seen, both birds in the sky, uh, navigating, looking for their breakfast in the surface of the water. Small critters and bugs scavenging for anything they could find to eat. And there were men at work, young men, old men, even very old men. Multiple generations of guys hard at work bringing to close their work shift. They worked third shift. Families whose lives were earned not in an office, not crafting something with their hands, not out on the road in transportation, but see, it was on the sea that they earned a living wage. And all up and down the shoreline, you could see families hard at work, working in teams, grandfathers, fathers, sons, even great-grandsons, bringing in their boats, unloading the tools of their trade on the shoreline. They were all fishermen. Now this was almost a daily routine for these fishermen, and if you were on the beaches most days, you would see the same scene play out over and over and over again for a few hours each morning. The sunlight starts to peek up over the horizon, indicating to the fishermen out on the water that their, their time to effectively increase their catch was coming to a close. See, as net fishermen in this climate, on this sea, the bulk of their effective work was often done in the dark, especially in a sea because the sea was very deep, it was very large. And so at dusk each night, the fish would begin to venture closer to the surface, close enough to be ensnared by a net that was cast from a boat into the net of these fishermen. In the morning, as the sun would begin to rise, the surface of the water would increase in temperature, it would get warmer. And also with the light of the sun, predators could easily spot their breakfast. So as a result of necessity, the fish, when the sun would come up, would dive deep into the depths of the sea where it was cooler and safer. Now, being a fisherman was not an easy trade. It was quite difficult. It was not a predictable trade. It involved a lot of risk. Some nights, they would have success. Other times, many for, maybe for many nights in a row, they would go through dry spells. Each night they ventured out on the water, they did so with their best efforts, with the greatest skill, and in the most effective way that they knew possible. Yet they were often relying on the simple luck of the throw to see what might come into their nets, whether they were successful or not. Fathers would be working alongside their sons who were being raised to learn this trade so that they would, hoping they would take to it, that they would enjoy it, and that they would be hard workers willing to assist their family in this family business. See, in this culture, it was customary for dads to have a trade. And, and as they would have sons, they would raise those sons really as an apprentice to their trade. For many of these men, they were third or fourth or ninth generation fishermen. It was all they knew. It was all they thought about. And it was everything they'd been groomed to do in order to provide for their family's needs. On this day, though, as the water was lapping on the shore, as familiar as the scene was to the average person, there was a noticeable difference. There were spectators on the beach. And these extra people had not come out to the beach that morning because it was spring break. They hadn't come to the beach that day looking to play or soak up the sun. They hadn't come to watch the fishermen do what fishermen do for generations. They didn't come to watch them tend to their nets, nets that were probably older than many of the men using them, nets that had to be cleaned, Nets that had to be mended, dried out in the sun every day for a while until the work was officially done. The people weren't there to watch the dads training and equipping their sons for a future career on the sea. No, the people were there because a celebrity was in town, someone they'd heard about. He was a religious man that didn't seem to talk or act like most religious men did. In fact, the way he talked was unlike what most people said they'd ever heard anyone talk like before. The rabbi Jesus was on the beach that morning. Now this was before Jesus had apostles, before he had apprentices of his own that he was investing in and teaching. He was actually just beginning his ministry. And he was on the beach that day. And what was interesting about Jesus, even in those earliest days, is that wherever Jesus seemed to be, a crowd would quickly accumulate. They would follow. But to be honest, a crowd of this size in this location was rather annoying to the fishermen just trying to provide for their families. What made it even more bothersome was the fact that that night, 
had not been a very fruitful night for these fishermen. And so they came in to clean all of their gear and, and to, to pack up everything that they owned that, that accomplished their trade, yet they had nothing to show for the entire night of work. I mean, imagine going to work tomorrow, doing the same thing you always do, waking up in the morning, getting yourself rather, gathering together what you need. For them, it would have been gathering up their tools, commuting to work, which would have been uh, walking, carrying, hauling all of their equipment because they didn't want to leave it out at the surface of the water. And then they would work all night, prepare everything, load the boat, go out in the boat, spend all night on the water, working tirelessly, working their tails off, only to arrive at the end of their shift, have to clean everything not having gotten a paycheck at all to show for their work. I mean, this was how these fishermen felt this morning. They felt shortchanged. They felt upset, frustrated, and weary. But all the while they were fishing, expecting to catch something to provide, they were left empty, hungry, tired, and uneasy. As they were finishing up their predictable end of shift duties, Jesus was close enough for them to hear him preach. Many of them had parked on the beach and Jesus just happened to be within proximity where they could hear what he was saying. It was typical for fishermen in this culture to take quite a while in order to finish their work and to prepare for the next night of fishing before they could leave. They didn't just pull the boats up on the shore and then walk away. There was a lot of work to be done on the shore. And yet during their work to close up their responsibility, they had an awesome opportunity to listen to the words of Jesus. As time went on, the crowd began to grow in number and press in more and more on Jesus, uh, trying to get closer to him. Uh, You could kind of envision as he's there on the beach, people would gather around him. And after uh, not very long as he's teaching and instructing, as people are kind of crowding and crowding to kind of get access to him, it wasn't very long until he was kind of pinned down Uh, between the water to his back and a sea of people in front of him. It was then he looked over near him and spotted two boats parked on the beach nearby belonging to a couple of families that would work in teams as fishermen. Near the boats were young men who were in the middle of finishing their work were actually told that uh, they were cleaning and rinsing their nets. And right there, Jesus saw an opportunity. He boldly steps into one of the boats and asks the young man that's there, to push out a little bit from the shore. You can see the image on the screen. He did this so he could continue to teach. But now he had the safety of the water to keep from trampling him. Because they could stand there at the surface of the water and hear what this rabbi, this teacher, had to say without pressing him to get uh, covered in water. Now, at first you may think this request of Jesus was rude. After all, here's this young man in his boat. He'd been working all night doing what it is that fishermen do. Surely this young guy's ready to be done, ready to get home. But see, obviously, something inspired this young guy, Simon, to oblige Jesus' request, push out from the edge of the shore, and allow Jesus to sit there and to teach. Now, we don't know truly his motivation for this. Scripture doesn't tell us. Maybe he just wanted to get out of cleaning the nets again, so he left it for his brother Andrew to do and just kind of bailed on him. We don't know. But Simon, throughout the time they were working on the shore, he'd been listening to Jesus. He'd been listening for a while now. And apparently, he was impressed with something because when Jesus asked him to do this, he obliged. Imagine being Simon in that moment. Here's a crowd clamoring to get to Jesus. Many had walked a long ways just to hear what he had to say. Many were trying to fight their way to the front because they'd heard that this rabbi could heal, could do miracles, and and many had significant needs. And so they wanted to get to the front of the crowd. And just then, as people are trying to approach the rabbi, the rabbi approaches you, steps into your boat, and now says, hey, come sit with me, push out a little bit, and allow me to continue to teach. Can you imagine sitting there, hanging on every word Jesus had to say? Well, this is the account given to us in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 5. Can you imagine wearing the sandals of Simon that morning? That kind of one-on-one attention with Jesus. Now, we know at this time Simon was one of many random Jewish young guys learning the family trade from their dad. One guy just kind of plucked out of obscurity at this moment in time. Yet he would be someone who would never be forgotten because of the encounter he had with Jesus seated in a boat next to him. This is the young man Simon who will one day become the man Peter who Jesus will affirm as the rock based on his statement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah God had promised. And he'll kind of hand the mantle of leadership over to this knucklehead named Peter. Now, now we don't know how long they sat there in the boat. 
Could have been an hour, probably, in this culture, it was longer. Rabbi or teacher would preach and preach and share and share and talk. But all of a sudden, this moment in history takes a turn. And Jesus looks at Simon and makes an even odder request. Jesus is about to ask Simon to do something Simon had done a thousand times before, but Jesus is going to ask him to do it in a way in which Simon has never done it before. Remember, Simon just met Jesus. Just met him. He's amazed at what this guy has to say. He was up all night. He was tired. He worked hard. He'd already agreed to oblige to Jesus' initial request. And he'd listened while they were preparing their gear. And then he was sitting in the boat and he was listening and he was impressed. But now Jesus looks over and asks him for something more. Simon, I know you've done this a thousand times before your way. And this is going to sound kind of funny, but I want you to do it just once. I want to ask you to do it my way. I'm not asking you to leave your family behind. I'm not asking you to walk away. I'm not asking you to give me your boat or give your boat away to somebody else. I just want to ask you to do this one thing, one time, my way, and see what happens. So after Jesus had finished teaching, he looks over to Simon, and he said to Simon in Luke 5, verse 4, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Now, this initial response kind of gives us a peek into what Simon might have been thinking in that moment. Because here's this rabbi, this teacher that you maybe have heard about, maybe not. We don't really know what, what familiarity Simon had with Jesus at this moment. But the first thing he says is, hey, let's go out deeper. I'm done teaching. Let's go out deeper and let's go fishing. Hey, you want to go fishing with me? Let's go fishing. For Simon, he probably had these thoughts of like, well, paddle out, throw the nets, have a catch, like... At this point, Simon responds probably the way I would, probably more nicely than I would have responded because I would have been tired. And he says, Master, seriously? Like, like you're a really good teacher and like I've really enjoyed listening to you and, and, and I've heard that your dad was a carpenter and I've heard you can do stuff with wood and so that's great, but what in the world do you know about fishing, man? Like seriously, like this is the Sea of Galilee. It's only over 100 feet deep. It's the middle of the day. The surface of the water is warm. The fish are gone, man. They're beyond our reach. And by the way, we just spent the whole night out here in this very location, and we came up empty. There was nothing. And now you want to pretend you're a fisherman and go fishing? Now? Do you realize how much work will be required of me after we're done? I've got to clean the nets again and dry the nets again. You just want to pretend you're a fisherman for a few minutes? But see, then there's something in Simon that breaks loose before the next statement that he makes. And he says, ah, why not? You ever been there in a moment where it doesn't make sense to say yes to Jesus with what he's asking of you, but you say, you know what, I'm just, I'm going to trust you. There was something in Simon that, that caused him to trust Jesus. Maybe it was the hours that, that Jesus was teaching. It's significant in that every follower of Jesus, every believer is presented with an opportunity to, touch, to trust Jesus after they've been shared some information or content about who God is. See, Christianity is not a blind faith where we just have to take it and accept it. If anybody ever says, well, you just need to believe, you need to run away from that person and go talk to somebody else because God gives us an understanding of who he is. He reveals himself to us. He shows us he's trustworthy. He shows that he's faithful. We don't have to blindly believe in who God is. We know Jesus is the description. He is the way we can know the Father. We know his Holy Spirit is powerful and present. We can point to many places in Scripture and each other's lives to remind us of how good our God is. And so here's Simon with an opportunity to trust Jesus. Have you ever been there to trust Jesus to do something some way that you've done it a thousand ways, but he's asking you to do it just a little bit differently? Now, I'm not talking about after walking with Jesus for years where you know he's faithful. At this point, Simon's known Jesus for a few hours. All he's done is really listen to him preach to a crowd, and Jesus addresses him directly and says, hey, let's push out deeper. Let's go have a catch. Let's go fishing. And he says, all right. Something breaks loose in him. He says, it doesn't make sense for me to trust Jesus, but, but I'm going to. I mean, he kind of sounds initially like he's going to say, we worked all night. We haven't caught anything. I'm tired. It's ready. I'm ready for go home. Go ask somebody else. Because he knew he'd have to start all over with drying out his nets and cleaning them off again. But he responds and he says, because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, it's interesting what Simon says here because it's very specific. He doesn't say, he doesn't say well, because I believe it's going to work, let's go throw the nuts. 
Not because I think it's a good idea. Not because I think we're going to catch anything at all. Not because I think this is a good use of my time because I'm going to have to be here long after you leave, still tending and cleaning to everything that we've gotten in the dirty water again. He says, no, but, but because I've been listening, because I'm impressed, because there's something in me that wants to trust you because I loaned you my boat already and I listened some more and I have just enough respect for you. He calls him master. He says, I have enough respect for you. The only person I'd probably do this for is my dad because he owns the business and I got to do whatever the boss says. But, but you're asking me and I'm going to oblige you to this. I'm going to say yes again. And what Simon didn't know that in this moment, his life would forever change, forever. And verse six says, when they had done so. Now this is huge because what Luke is drawing attention to is that Simon had acted in faithful obedience demonstrating his trust. Luke writes when he researched before he wrote his gospel account. It's not when they believed that something would happen in the net. It's not when they thought about it and considered and weighed the pros and cons. It's not when they had the best intentions in their heart. It's not when they stepped away and said, well, let me go pray about that for a couple of weeks and then I'll decide if I'm going to go out and do that with you, Jesus, okay? No, when they had acted in faithful obedience, trusting Jesus, when they had done it, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat on the shore to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. What a visual. Here's these big wooden boats and they're beginning to sink in the middle of the day when you don't go out fishing. And when Simon Peter saw this, what do you think he did? I mean, if it was me, you know, I'm probably out there, maybe my brother Andrew's with me and we're letting down this net and all of a sudden we pull it up, you know, and then you, you look to the shore. I mean, how do you respond? You're like, woohoo, dad, dad, are you seeing this? Like, this is amazing. We don't have to work for a month. Like, we got so much. We got to stop by Sears and get another freezer. We don't have enough to store all of this. No. Peter, Simon, at this time, says he fell to his knees. And this is amazing because now his next statement transcends fish and fishing. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees. And the image we have here is not after they arrived at the shore. They're still out in the water. So this boat's filled with fish. Can you imagine Simon almost disappearing in the fish with like, like a, a ball pit? You know what I mean? Like all that's left is shoulders. And so he gets down on his knees and he's like, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. In that moment, Peter recognizes for the first time who Jesus is, and he sees who he is in relationship to Jesus. He'd been shoulder to shoulder, eyeball to eyeball with the Savior of the world, the Son of God for a few hours, but it wasn't until he took a step of obedience that something broke loose in the way that he saw Jesus. It wasn't until he took a step of faith, until he acted in faithful obedience, till he said yes to something Jesus asked him to do. Something he'd done a thousand times before, but Jesus was asking him to do it in a different way. Suddenly then his eyes were open. Suddenly then his heart was receptive. And he experienced something he never imagined experienced that forever altered the course of his life. In verse 9 it says, For he, Simon, and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they'd taken. And so were James and John, the son of Zebedee, Simon's partners that were on the shore. Then Jesus said to Simon... I love this. Don't be afraid because obviously they're freaked out with just what just happened. I mean, this doesn't happen. This isn't normal. This is weird. This is odd. They've never heard of this occurring before. In, in a moment, they've kind of rethought everything that their dads and grandpas have always trained them about fishing. Is this how we should have done it all along? Like, is that what this rabbi knows? No, this is a miracle. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore left everything and followed him. Right here at the very beginning, when Simon first meets Jesus, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, Jesus points these four common fishermen to the destiny for the rest of their lives that they'll chase. And it's the exact same thing that he'll tell them in Matthew 28 and Acts 1-8, the Great Commission, before he leaves. The same thing. And yet, even in this initial invitation, the first step for these four, for all 12 disciples, for you and me today, is a very simple invitation by Jesus. Just follow, listen, and watch. See, every person in this room, everyone joining us online, 
If, if you're here and you're like, I don't know really what I believe about Jesus. I don't know really where my faith rests. And you may say that's kind of where you're at. You might say online that's where you're at as well. I, I dare you to respond to this simple invitation to say, I I'll follow Jesus. I'll listen. I'll watch. And, and don't worry about what you believe or what you don't believe right now. Because see, everybody that chooses to follow Jesus, even Simon at this moment, says yes to Jesus, follows him, places himself in proximity to Jesus. He didn't believe anything initially. It came throughout the course of the journey. And this invitation to follow, one of the things we have to realize, the invitation to follow is not a religious invitation. It's a relational invitation. So far, oftentimes, there's people in our culture that what holds them back from becoming a part of a church or from, from becoming a part of a faith community is we think that this idea of following Jesus is a relational I I I invitation. It's not, or I mean, a, a, a religious invitation. It's not. It's a relational invitation invitation because Jesus was preaching a message different than religion preaches oftentimes religion preaches that you know if you will change then you can join us on the journey you know if, if you'll change if you'll do what we do and say what we say and eat what we eat and not do what we don't do if you can kind of toe the line and your behavior is acceptable in our sight then you can join us but if not then get out that was kind of the mindset of the Pharisees at this time and Jesus dealt with it very specifically very directly he didn't mince words and, and for some here, this is why you dropped out of church years ago. Because you didn't feel, you'd be there and you didn't feel like you were a good enough person. You'd be there and you just feel guilty all the time. You didn't feel like you could be religious enough, like all the other religious nut jobs around you. You didn't feel like you could keep all the rules. Because the rules were long and they were difficult and you just, you didn't have the capacity to keep them and other people seemed like they could. Maybe you felt like you just didn't belong. So you decided, you know, I don't act like a church person, so I probably shouldn't be in church. And I'm not very religious, so I probably shouldn't be a part of a religious movement. And, you know, if I'm ever going to do this, I've got to change a lot of things in me so that when I come back, I'll be accepted. I'll feel like I belong. I won't feel guilty all the time. And so maybe even now to this day, that's why you don't come to church a lot, because you just feel overwhelmed with guilt. Because under your own strength and your own power, you just can't do some of the things or not do some of the things that you think you don't have to, that you're not allowed to do. Sometimes we can feel all out of place within the context of the church, which is the place where we should find the greatest belonging we've ever found. So you need to understand this is the message of religion. Do this and get to God. Do this and he'll receive you. And what was amazing about Jesus was his message was the opposite. In fact, his message was so dangerous by the religious institution of his day that they put a plan in place to execute him, didn't they? To crucify him. They wanted to stop they believed that what he had to say, what he believed, what he was preaching was a threat. They believed it was disturbing to their religious system. And Jesus was flipping upside down this idea. Jesus invited people to follow. He says, come follow me. He says, I'm, I'm going to change you then. He says, come hang out with me. Come live life on life with me. In essence, he's saying the opposite of this. He's, like, he's saying, come and join me, and then you're going to change. See, religion kind of declares, if you change, you can join us. But if you're not going to look like us, then it's time for you to get out. Jesus demonstrates, not just what he says, but it's what he demonstrates. He says, hey, I've, called, I've come to call the sinners. Like, come join me in life. And what you're going to see is over time, you're going to change. Get close to me. Listen to me. Take a few notes over time. And you're going to find yourself looking in the mirror. And you're not going to recognize the reflection of the person looking back. You're going to say, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know who this woman is. I don't know who the person is that's making these decisions that I've never made before. I've done these things a thousand times before, but now I'm doing them differently, and I don't even know why. I just know that I'm getting closer to Jesus. You start to see that you're changing, and your change is not experienced because of discipline. You don't change just because you get more discipline. You don't change because it's what you're capable of authoring in your life. You don't change because you decided to change. But you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to see that the only reason that you're transformed, the only reason that you don't recognize the person in the mirror is because you've just decided to follow Jesus, to get closer to him. And he changes things in the heart level first, and then it begins to manifest itself in what we say and how we think and what we do and how we behave and how, we, how to treat people. In fact, you're surrounded with people all around you in this room <coughs> who if they were to tell you their story of what God has done in their life, it would not be a, you know, one day I woke up, and I decided, that's it, I'm done with this, I'm not doing it anymore, and boom. They had the self-control and self-power to self-correct, and everything was different. No. If you become part of a community group where, where you're meeting with people in a, in a smaller environment, whether it's here at the church or in somebody's living room somewhere or a restaurant, 
you're going to start to hear stories shared. If you start serving on a ministry team and you, you, you make that commitment to come a little bit early to be with the greeters or the children's ministry or to be on worship, worship or tech, what you're going to begin to hear is people sharing their stories and their stories of change and transformation are not like it's an event where everything after that was different, but it was a process. A decision they made consistently to say yes to Jesus and then to say yes again, then to say yes again until they finally found themselves in a place they never thought they'd be. This initial invitation by Jesus to his disciples to follow, it's the same one he's offering to every single one of us today. And you need to understand, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a believer, it doesn't matter how long you've been a believer, a disciple, this invitation to follow is not one that a Christian grows out of. It's actually one a Christian grows into more and more. It's a desire that fuels us. It's, it's, it's a gasoline we put in the tank that, that, that carries us further, faster, farther, more beautifully than anything we could ever do in ourselves. It's trusting him with small steps of faith, saying, yep, God was right again. Yep, God was right again. God was right again. All this is hard, but I'm going to trust him. Yep, God was right again. It causes us to want to cl- trust him, follow him even closer. Now, this is really the question we're going to ask for the next few weeks. Am I following Jesus? Not how far have I gotten compared to somebody else, not how consistently do I go to church, not how many verses in the Bible did I read this week, or how many verses have I memorized, or do I know all the books of the Bible, but but am I simply following Jesus? Am I taking the next step to keep chasing after him? Not in comparison, not am I ahead of this person, or behind this person, or how do I equate or compare to this person? No. Am I simply following Jesus? Am I saying yes to the next thing he asks of me? Not have I arrived, am I a fully mature Christian yet? You'll never be fully mature. All of us still have these places in our lives where Paul says we need to, we need to decrease so Christ can increase. That's a lifelong process. That's the sanctifying work God does. We'll never arrive. We can reflect on this encounter today where Simon Peter first met Jesus. And we can see that it was a process for him to see Jesus unlike you ever saw him before. It was saying yes, saying yes, saying yes, saying yes. Now, the one thing we have to be careful of, especially if you're familiar with the content of God's word, is we can kind of look at this first encounter Simon had with Jesus, and we can carry into it everything Simon would become, every other decision Simon would make in his life as God changed his name to Peter, and we can kind of carry that knowledge into this, but I encourage you to step back and understand or approach it from only what we know at Luke chapter 5. Simon was a young man, probably still a teenager even. His, heart, his life had hardly began, which in essence, he was just getting on the interstate of life. Just getting on the interstate of life. He was young. His life was just really beginning. I see many of us here in this room, and uh, we're all on the interstate of life, whether we want to admit it or not. Some of us have been on the interstate for a while, right? We show signs of wear and tear from the road. There's some seasons in life where by your own account or testimony, you would say, you know, there was a season in my life where I was really, you know, I was fast, loose, and out of control on the highway, right? I mean, there were things going on that, uh, that, that maybe you would even say I was completely out of control. Like, I don't even know who that person was. I don't know what was happening. There's other times in life where we, we experience a crisis, and it feels like time just stops. Like, how can this be happening? Our world is crumbling. It's like we're pulled over on the side of the interstate, broke down, and we don't know who to call or where to turn or what to do next. We just know that that this is a disaster. There's times where we also feel like things are moving along at a snail's pace, like we just want to get to the end of this season of life, but we're stuck in bumper-to-bumper traffic, and it's frustrating. Now, here at Fusion, we like to, to, to operate kind of in series is where we talk about a topic and explore it for a few weeks from a few different perspectives. And this series, I've kind of chosen to call A Road to a Disciple. What's the road to disciple? It, it kind, kind of because the, the focus of this series is to look at what a disciple is inherently and what a disciple is not that sometimes we suppose is a disciple. But also with this, as we're on the road, all of us are on the highway of life, to identify exit ramps God wants us to take in life. Places he wants to lead us off the highway to hear what he has to say. Because we can just kind of keep driving fast and furious, right? Down the highway and do our own thing and do our own ways. But, but God wants to bring us to places and say, hey, I, w- I want you to, you're going to keep driving. But, but, and you've been driving a long way. You've driven hundreds, thousands of miles. But I want you to drive the next few thousand miles differently than you've ever driven them before. Last summer during my sabbatical, my wife, my wife and I put a lot of miles on our, 
you know, cute little minivan. And, and one thing we became very familiar with, especially with three little girls in the van, a couple that were still working on potty training, were the exit ramps. And those icons or logos that all of us are familiar with on the exit ramps, right? Fuel and food and sleeping. And there's a telephone, which I don't see that one very much anymore. Hospital, camping. <coughs> See, there were times along the journey for all of us when you're on a road trip where you start to get hungry, right? And you see that little logo there with the plate and the silverware. It's time to eat something that's going to satisfy that hunger because the combos, potato chips, and chocolate just ain't doing it anymore. There's times where we're weary, right? You've been sitting a long time, driving a long time, and you just need to get out and stretch or walk around. You need to get out of the position you're in. Maybe it's time to sleep because you're starting to do it while you're driving, and that's a bad idea. There were times where, we, we, where I would look down at the gauge and you could see, okay, we got to get some more fuel because we're going to be empty soon. And uh, that's not going to be fun to be on the side of the road. And so we need to look for that fuel indicator so we can get off and, and keep going. There's times on a road trip where you get edgy. You ever been edgy on a road trip, especially with kids in the back? Probably. Sometimes you get edgy because of the people you're on the trip with. We won't go there today. Sometimes you get edgy because you're not quite sure if you know how to get where you need to go. Sometimes you get edgy because you think you might have missed your exit and you, weren't, you didn't have the GPS turned up loud enough to hear it. You get a little frustrated. Sometimes you get edgy because you don't know if the vehicle you picked for the trip is actually going to get you to where you need to go. Uh, that was our case just south of D.C. last summer with our minivan. We're like, okay, time to pull over and give this baby a rest for the night and see if it starts the next day. There's times where we're uneasy. We're uneasy growing uncomfortable in the car to where we start to shift around a lot, right? Why? Because you've got to get out and go potty, right? I mean, that's the way we treat it with our kids. You've got to unload what's inside of you because if it stays there, it will poison you. The same in all of these regard is identical to our spiritual lives. See, along the road of life, God is faithful. And he constantly is trying to lead us to take exit ramps, to trust him with small steps of faith for us to say, yes, Jesus, I trust you. And experiencing how rewarding it is to live life, to do it his way instead of our way. When you really look at the life of Simon, his first exit ramp, as he was working, was just to listen to Jesus talk. It was after he had listened for a while that he had the opportunity to say yes. And Jesus said, hey, I push this boat out from the shore. I'm going to borrow it for a while. And he says, okay. And he does it. It was then he chose to keep listening instead of taking a nap, which is probably what his flesh really wanted to do. It was then Jesus had a second request. Hey, let's push out deeper. And Simon begrudgingly obliged. Because why? Because I respect you, master. Jesus says, hey, let's de- let down the nets. Let's go fishing. And even though Simon, knowing the work that would be required if he did this, said, yes, this is going to come at a cost, but I'm going to trust you. He then chose to ask for help from his partners, the community he was a part of on the shore as as, as he said, hey guys, I, I need your help. This is bigger than what I can carry. This is more than what I can navigate. Led him then to the, the choice in the midst of the fish to kneel down and to declare Jesus, not as master now, but Lord, away from me because I'm a sinful man. To see himself differently than he had seen himself ever before and to see Jesus for who he was. It was after that Jesus said, hey, you want to follow me? That's Matthew's account of this encounter. You know, it's interesting when you look at Matthew, who was a Jewish guy, just kind of telling his story of what he witnessed and what he saw. When he gets to this portion of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, it's just four or five verses. Chapter four, verses like 18 to 22, he just says, Jesus shows up on the shore, sees these four young guys fishing. He says, hey, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And they just drop everything and say, see you, dad. Hope you have a great life. You know, enjoy it. Hopefully you can find somebody to replace us. I mean, that's kind of how we read it. And it's like, there had to be more than that. And Luke, the doctor, who's a lot more detail-oriented, gives us the, 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 the logistics of what played out that day. And so Jesus gives him this invitation to follow, and, and that's an exit ramp. And, and, and Simon says, okay, yeah, I'm going to follow. I don't know what this is going to look like. It's unpredictable. But I'm going to follow you as a disciple. It's later, a couple of years later, after hanging around Jesus, listening to him, watching him, both publicly and privately, When Jesus asks a question, he says, hey, who do people say that I am? He says, hey, who do you say that I am? And Simon, who was always quick to speak up, speaks up and says, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You're the one we've been waiting for. That was an exit ramp to stand up and speak what God was showing him was true. It wouldn't be very much longer, weeks, maybe a month, when he would stand 
before a middle school girl and deny that he even knew Jesus under threat of his own life. It was a moment where he didn't get off on the exit ramp to boldly proclaim what he knew to be true, but he just kind of stayed on the highway doing it his way because he was scared. Just a few weeks later on the day of Pentecost, that same guy would stand publicly in front of thousands and proclaim the gospel verbally for the very first time where 3,000 people would say yes to Jesus and give their lives to him. And it was the same Simon Peter that many years later, after a life of ministry and sharing the gospel with people, eventually would be crucified, the same as his Savior. See, Simon took exit ramps along the way. And you and I have the same opportunity as well. In fact, we could even, in this moment, break into smaller groups and we could begin to share the times where we knew God was saying, hey, get off for a minute. Get off the highway. Quit doing things your way. I want you to do it my way. I want you to try something differently. I want you to look differently at this area of your life than you've ever looked at it before. And if you'll do it, you'll see me differently and you'll see yourself differently than you've ever seen it before. Simon took exit ramps along the way. And we have the same opportunity. See, there's times on the highway of life where we get off on an exit because we're hungry to see what Jesus has to say about what we're experiencing in life. Maybe you're like, I know there's more to life than what I'm living. I know there's got to be more out there. And so even you, you keep coming to church because you're just hungry to find out what that is. And so you're following Jesus. Maybe, maybe you exit the highway in a season because you're weary of doing life your way. You've been doing it your way and it's not leading to what it is you were hoping you would experience by this point in life. And so you're just tired of doing it your way and you're ready to get off the highway and see how God wants you to live the next few thousand miles. Maybe you're ready to take the next exit because you're running on fumes. Everything that used to fill up your tank, it's just not sustaining you anymore. It worked for a while, but the reality was it, it's now depleting you. It's not significant enough to keep you moving forward, to keep you going. And so you need a whole new fuel in the tank, and you sense that. And so you're interested in getting off the exit ramp of life so you can see what Jesus has to say about it. Maybe you've been in a season where you need to take the next exit because you're getting a little edgy. You're getting a little edgy with the people around you or the situation that you're in. You're not sure if you're headed in the right direction, and so you need to kind of pull off the interstate and see what Jesus has to say. Maybe you're just uneasy and you're irritable because maybe there's something that you continue to let exist inside of you that if you let it stay there, it's going to poison you and you've got to get rid of it. But God wants to help you with it. What is your next step in faith? What's the next exit ramp God's calling you to take so that you can continue to follow Jesus? What step is next for you to keep following him? The first one, very practically, may just be to say yes to listening. Like Simon Peter did, he was busy with life. He was doing what it was that fishermen do, but he was in close enough proximity to hear Jesus speak. So for you, maybe your next step is just simply to say, you know what, I got to keep coming to church. But maybe you need to say, I need to come more consistently, not just when it's convenient, not just when it's, when it's easy, but, but I need to intentionally put myself in this environment where I can... <clears throat> where I can hear more about Jesus, where I can be informed more about him so I can make decisions. And you say, I need this for me, but I also need this for my kids or for my grandkids that I bring with me. And you're just understanding that you've just got to say yes to keep listening and putting yourself in those environments to see what happens. Maybe what you need to say is, you know what? I need to, to, to plant myself in relationship with other people here at Fusion. You need to step into community as you follow Jesus so that not only you're hearing from God, but you're hearing what other people are experiencing in their relationship with God so that it can give you a new perspective so you might see him unlike you've ever seen him before to follow him more closely than ever before. Maybe for you, it's a very simple next step of, you know what? It's time to start opening the Bible on your own. To open the Bible, not, not just wait for this corporate environment to discover Jesus or to hear about Jesus, but outside of this, on your own, start spending time with Jesus in God's holy word. And, and I want to encourage you, if that's a step you want to take, uh, we, we want to come alongside and assist you in any way that we can. Uh, would you pull out your communication card for me for just a second? Everybody in the room, please. There's a number of things on, on the back that are, there's some boxes there that you can check, but there's also a prayer request box. And here's what I want to ask you to do. You may not have a prayer request or praise day. That's fine. But I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to say yes to some next step that God is calling you to. And it could be one of these ones I've listed on the screen. It may be something else entirely. Maybe you already know what God's been saying you need to do. And so you can write it down right now and say, you know what? It's, I can't escape it anymore. And God's going to hold me accountable because he's shown this to me. And so I need to take this step. I, I want to encourage you to capture in words what it is God is speaking to you is your next step in your faithful journey. Because if you think you're a disciple, if you think you're following Jesus, but you can't point to actions of faithful obedience, you're not actually following him. 
You're a fan, you're not a follower. A follower is revealed in that you're taking a step towards him. You're following after him where he's leading you. So I'm encouraging you, as, as God maybe speaks to your heart today, to capture in words. Now, nobody's going to show up at your house and hold this over your head and be legalistic about it. That's not the point. The point is for you to not just have great intentions as you leave, but have a, a record of expectations that God has led you to. So maybe it's beginning to open the Bible at home and you would say, hey, I need help with reading the Bible. Write that down. We would love, we'd be honored to come alongside and help you with, with what it looks like. A, a second step, which was the, kind of the next step for, for Simon, was saying yes to borrowing his boat. Jesus asked Simon to let him use something he had of value. Maybe you need to give a little more of your time and attention than just coming to the worship service on Sunday morning. We talk about from time to time, Kathy mentioned it earlier in our time together, Starting Point Cafe is made available to people who are fairly new in the life of the church. It's that opportunity to find out more about who we are as a church, find out the details about the gospel of Jesus, find out who we believe God's called us to be as a body, and find a way in which you can get connected into the church in a little more intentional way. We're going to be hosting this on April 2nd. It'll actually be happening during this service, starting right after the first service at 1030, and so it'll be happening on Sunday, April 2nd. And you can sign up, register to be a part of that. You can even uh, write it right there on, those, on that, that exit ramp under prayer request. Just say, I need to be at Starting Point Cafe. And you'll, you'll get followed up with this week about that. Maybe it's to start serving in some area of ministry. That's really what Jesus asked. He said, Simon, can I use your boat? Would you push out a little bit? Will you serve the people that are here by giving me a platform to, to speak? And Simon said, Sure. Maybe it's time for you to say, yeah, I can, I can show up early one Sunday a month, or I can serve in kids' ministry, or in the adult service, or, or as a greeter, or, or during the week in the office. I mean, there's so many different opportunities that you can serve, and what's great about serving is it's going to put you in proximity to people for you to develop relationships and friendships with. The third step that we see Simon take here in this account is he was given the opportunity to trust Jesus by pushing out into deeper water and casting the net in the water. Maybe for you, it's time to take a more significant step of faith. Something where you're trusting God to do what it is only he can do. Something where you've done it a thousand times before your way, but now you're going to do it God's way and you're going to trust him for it. You're not doing it because you think you're going to catch any fish. You're not doing it because it's a good idea. You're not doing it because you think it's a good use of your time. No, you're going to do it because you trust Jesus. And you're going to be obedient to how he's calling you to live. Most likely, God's going to speak to you in one of three areas. He's going to challenge you relationally. He's going to challenge you professionally. Or he's going to challenge you financially. Because those are often three of the areas where we get the most comfortable and operate out of bad habits. So he's going to speak to something different you need to do at work. Where you've been doing it your way, he wants you to operate differently in relationship to the people you work with. There's going to be a different approach at home where he's calling you to, to, to he's going to empower you to adjust something at home. Or he's going to give you a, a different approach to how you handle finances. Maybe it's a practical step in that direction where you need to trust Jesus at his word. You know, it's interesting. Simon was very public and vulnerable as he cast his net out into the sea where people could see him. And I'm sure as just as he was about to release that net, there was some insecurity in Simon. Can you imagine it? He already said, uh, we, we can tell by Luke's account, that James and John were on the shore. They're partners in, in, in fishermanry, or whatever you call it. So there's their fishing buddies, right? They're on the shore. They've got everything cleaned up, ready to go. Can you imagine? I mean, the, the, they work as a team, so they know each other well. James and John, the son of Zebedee, looking out at the boat that Simon had pushed out with Jesus. Maybe at this point, Andrew's in the boat with him, because Simon's roped his brother into being out there to help throw the net out. I, I don't know. But anyways, can you imagine me and James and John, and the, you, you see them now, Jesus is done, and Jesus talks to Simon, but you can't hear what it is, and all of a sudden, they're going out into deeper water. It's like, what, what's he doing? What's he doing? Like, they're talking on the shore, and then all of a sudden, they see him getting ready the net. Like, what in the world is this idiot doing? Has he not been listening to his dad? What's, what's he doing with the net? He's going to have to start all over again. He's got to clean it, dry it, mend it, all that kind of stuff. And can you imagine, I can almost see Simon kind of standing on the boat, Andrew across from him, and, and they're ready to throw it. And just then they kind of pause and take a deep breath because there's a huge crowd of people watching him. And they're like, we look like idiots. And then all of a sudden they go to throw it, only moments later to see it overflowing with fish so much they can't haul it up out of the water to where the boat's starting to tip. And they're like, guys, we need to get out here. Maybe you've been listening for a while. 
Maybe you've been around church for a bit and you're seeing Jesus as God and you're seeing that, that he is not like any other figure in history. You're seeing that these four gospel accounts we have of this ancient figure Jesus are far more than any other ancient figure we have record of. This simple carpenter from Nazareth. And you're beginning to see that, that, that this is not just a guy, not just a teacher, not just a religious figure, but this was God. This was God in the flesh, that he lived a life I couldn't live, that his death was for me, that his resurrection was for me. And maybe you're at that place where you're saying, yes, Jesus, I'm ready to receive that. Yes, I'm ready to say, I'm ready to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple. I trust you. I want a relationship with you. Maybe you're ready for salvation. You can indicate that on your back of the card. It says, I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. I'm ready to say, yes, I believe him. I believe he's the son of God. I believe that he died to set me free. Maybe it's time for you to come forward publicly because you made the private faith decision about Jesus, but you haven't been baptized yet. You've said yes to Jesus as your savior, but maybe nobody else really realizes it and you've received him. And now your next step is to come forward with that information. Today, right after we're done with our worship experience here, right in this back room, uh, we're going to have what we call a baptism briefing. It's an opportunity for me to talk with you specifically about what baptism is all about. And I want to invite everybody that would like to, to join me as soon as we dismiss. You can leave your kids where they are. It's only going to take us about seven to ten minutes. We're just going to talk real briefly about baptism. I'll answer any questions that you have about it, just so you can be given more content to make a decision with. Maybe that's your exit ramp. Your next step is to go public with your faith. And then there's the fourth one, the one that alters the course of Simon's life going forward. Jesus says, leave your nets, leave your nets behind, follow me. Come follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Trusting Jesus with everything, he begins the process of surrender. Now understand, surrender that sanctifying work that God brings us to, it's not an event that happens. All of a sudden, boom, God has everything and life is all hunky-dory. No, surrender is a process. It's not something we do once. It's something we do over and over and over again because we have a tendency to just kind of grab it and hold it again. And, and we have to discipline ourselves and remind ourselves what we believe about God, that he's trustworthy. And we have to put it down and we have to offer it to him once again. Maybe you look at your life and you know that there's a few areas of life where you've just been messing around. You kind of look to God, you're like, well, God, I'm going to trust you with this because I really want you to bless it. So I'll trust you with this, but, but these two or three things, God, uh, no, 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 I'm going I'm to hold on to those. I'm going to do those my way. Um, but, but if you could really bless this one, that would be great, God. You know, and then, then here's something else I think I'm ready to trust you with, but there's still three or four things going to lock the door and hide the key from you, and I'm going to control those. And maybe you say, I'm just, I'm just done playing the silly games. God, my whole life, it's yours, all of it. I want to give you everything because I trust you. I want to trust you with my present and my future, my relationships, my finances, my career, my calling, my strengths, my weaknesses. God, I want to give you everything. It's yours. I want you to understand today, the challenge is not to find the, the next step you need to take because you feel guilty about not doing it. That's not the goal. That will not be a lasting decision. It isn't about taking the step you feel obligated to take. It's not even about taking the step that you think is best for you in this season of your life. It's all about taking the next step that God's Holy Spirit is giving you clarity around. Because we're told in Scripture that those who are free in Christ are free indeed. And there's another step of freedom God wants to bring you to. So often we think that when we say yes to Jesus, it's going to put us in bondage. It doesn't. It actually sets us free. It's all about taking the next step God's leading your heart to take. Because every single one of us, no, long, no matter how long we've been a follower of Jesus or whether we've just started, all of us have a next step. All of us are looking for an exit ramp on the highway of life that God is leading us to take. Because there's seasons in life where we're hungry, where we're weary, where we're empty, where we're edgy, where we're uneasy. And you know, come on, you know this you know that you don't want to spend your life wondering what God might have done if you'd said yes back then. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, it's so easy to sit on this side of history and know what occurred in Simon Peter's life. A remarkable man who forever made an impact on history. Not because he was so smart or wise, not because he was amazing or incredible, but because he simply just kept saying yes to you. Not perfectly. He was flawed just like all of us, but he chose to follow you, to be a disciple. 
which was an every day, every week, every month, every year decision to keep putting one step, one foot in front of the other, following after you. Lord, I pray for those who are gathered here in this place. God, you would point out those areas where they're hungry or weary, where they're empty, where they're edgy, where they're uneasy. Would you help them to see, Lord, that that's not the life you, live, you created them for? It's not the life you promised them. It's not the life that you've redeemed them for. Sure, there's seasons where things get difficult, but the whole reason for the difficulty is to remind us of how good you are, Lord. To remind us of how grateful we are to have a relationship with you that even through the difficult stuff, you are there walking into it, through it with us. God, would you help us to see that as believers in Jesus, as disciples, that we never grow past the following. That it's an everyday decision to say, yep, today I'm going to keep following Jesus. Today, I'm going to keep following Jesus.